them fighting spirits up here. Praise God. <laughs> They're doing their thing. Glory to God. Amen. Appreciate you all being here this morning. God bless you. And all of you that are joining us on Facebook, happy to have you to be a part of this service. And uh, amen. And you are. Praise God. There's no distance with God. And in fact, that's even part of what I'm going to talk about this morning. But God is everywhere. All the time. Praise the Lord. Amen. So God bless all of you that are here today, whether you're by uh, Facebook, uh, live streaming, or here in person. We appreciate it, and uh, God acknowledges that. And there's no distance with God, so whatever God's doing here, He can be doing at your place. And whatever He's doing where you are, we can receive the benefit of it as well. So praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. I want to I want to start uh, this morning in Ephesians chapter 3, and as usual... I'll be as random as possible, praise the Lord, because that's what happens when I'm doing this, praise the Lord. But I do feel like uh, God's given me something to share with you today, and, and uh, usually it comes over time and just, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, and sometimes I just wake up in the middle of the night and he gives me something else, and I don't have sense enough to know if it's for this one or the next one, so I just put it all together, praise the Lord, and that's where we end up. But in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, I'd like to read verses 16 through 19. Ephesians 3, uh, 16 through 19. And this just kind of set things up a little bit uh, for where I'd like to try to be obedient to the Spirit. Praise the Lord. So in Ephesians three sixteen, he said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So he says, uh, breadth, that we would know him, breadth, length, depth, and height. Now, that's what is normally referred to as a continuum or space-time. And we've, I've taught on this, similar things to this before. And uh, space-time, it, 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 actually the definition, if you look it up in the dictionary, says a four-dimensional continuum. And uh, that means with four coordinates. The three dimensions of space and then time. And uh, in which, within that, any event can be located, and it's also called a space continuum. Now, that's what Einstein was dealing with. It, what made me think about this was uh, Wednesday at uh, Bible study, and uh, Robin Bullock had talked about some things about uh, uh, time travel. And, of course, that's Einstein's th the theory of relativity, and it's all about a space-time continuum, as that's where it came from, and he's riding on a bus. This is the way it started out. He was riding on a bus one day, and he saw a clock off in the distance, and as he looked at the clock, it came to him that if I could drive fast enough or ride the bus would move fast enough, I could get there. It was say, say it's three minutes till noon. And if I could go, you know, twice as fast here, I could be there at a minute and a half before noon. If I could go three times as fast, I could get there at noon. And, you know, in theory, if I could go... Ten times faster, I could get there before noon. Yeah. I could get there before the time that it is right now. Right. Now, that's kind of, you know, out there, but that's the theory of time travel. Well, what Robin uh, Bullock had said was he, that people were talking about this, and they said, well, can you, is time travel possible? They said, yeah, of course, we know that it's possible. Well, then why don't we, how come we can't do it? And he said, because we don't have the power. It's the power that's keeping us from it. Right. Well, here's what God is saying. We have resurrection power. Yes. That's how Jesus is able to just be there, you know, and he's here and then he's in heaven and resurrection power. It's, it's the greatest power that there is in the universe. It's greater than any atomic bomb. It's greater than anything. So if we look at this, he says uh, the physical uh, reality that's inherent in such a continuum that we're talking about here, the normal one that we think of, is... Uh, Length, breadth, and height, plus time. Well, he gives us, God is telling us right here, 
that he's already given us something that's beyond that, beyond the norm, beyond what science talks about in the natural. Because he adds another one. He says depth. So what is depth? Well, it's past one's ability of understanding. That's the definition, right? So I'm going to share something with you this morning, and you'll think I'm freaked out, and it may freak you out, but I've, I've shared it with, I've, maybe with the church before years back, but about, I don't know when it was, it was maybe 10 years ago or something, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I was on my way from home to the church. Well, it's about a 35-minute drive uh, legally, praise <laughs> the Lord, and so it's usually 35 minutes to get here. And uh, especially if I have my wife with me watching the speedometer. She's my navigator, hallelujah. But anyway, at that time, I used to always drive from our house, which is in the country. Uh, and I'd drive the first couple miles, and then there's a stop sign, and then another mile, and then you're on Highway 65, which ultimately ends up being uh, Hubble. That's the way I used to get, drive all the time. I don't anymore, but that's the way I used to go. So this particular morning... I was coming down to the church, and I left the house, and I drove, and I got to that first stop sign, which is a mile away from Highway 65. I stopped at that stop sign, and then I'm at the church. Now, you don't have to believe any of this, but I experienced it. I was there at the stop sign, and then I'm at the church. When I looked at the clock, now, I, looked at the, I, I didn't look at the clock immediately as I went out the door, but I looked at the clock before I left the house. And when I looked at the clock here at the church, it was less than 10 minutes from the time that I had looked at it at home. Now, I don't know how much time passed before I actually left the house and drove to that first stop sign and stopped, but the first stop sign is like two or three miles from the house. And then from, uh, from that to the church would be a 30-minute drive at least. Less than 10 minutes had passed from the time that I had seen it, the clock at home, and when I was here. And I didn't remember anything from that stop sign until I was sitting in the parking lot out here in front of the church. So you can think I'm nuts, which has already been defined by m multiple people. But, uh, <laughs> or you can realize that this is possible. Yeah. Why God did it, I don't know, other than to just show me that he can do anything. I was going through a lot of stuff at that time, not negative things. I was, that's when I was running everywhere for impartation and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Well, the Lord spoke to me in a lot of different ways at that time and was showing me a lot of things. But that is something I'll never forget. It was the, it was the weirdest, strangest. I, I, was, I had a weird sensation all day long because of that. It was almost like uh, almost being sick but not sick. I don't know how to describe it. I just felt everything felt out of whack. But I'm telling you what God is capable of doing. And he can do it for anybody. He did, he did it for me. I don't know why, because I wasn't asking for it. I was, I was doing a lot of the things that I'm doing now, in, in a, maybe in a different way, but which is just simply what I'm, everything that I'm focused on now in terms of prayer is to be one with God, is to think his thoughts. In fact, I, when I'm praying, I'm, I'm always saying, I only want to say what you're saying. I only, want to, I only want to do what I see you do. I want to see this through your eyes. I want to hear it through your ears. I want to, I want to experience this the way you experienced it. Amen. I want to be connected. I want to be conscious of your presence all the time. Yes. Amen. And I'm not saying that to be a weird, you know, religious, because this isn't about religion. This is about walking in the spirit literally walking in the spirit that's that's the way it, what it means to me anyway the way i'm describing it may not be the same for everybody but for me that's the way it is so with that in mind i want to continue on here with ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 10 through 14 and these scriptures may sound random and they may be but they make sense to me and that's the only way i can do it so hopefully it'll make sense to you before we get through but in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, I want to read verses 10 through 14. And he says, The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, that which, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there's no end. 
and much study is a weariness of flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Isaiah 41, verse 4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. Verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit. How many of you know in the spirit realm there is no time and there's no limitations of space? So God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is what God's been talking to me about. I think it's answered a prayer for me anyway, and whether it has anything to do with any of you, you're just stuck with my, my prayers. Praise the Lord. But in the spirit... There is no time and there is no space. And you, most of you have experienced that. You get into prayer and, you know, when, you, when you're trying to force yourself to, prayer, to pray, five minutes can seem like an eternity. But when it just happens, you can be in prayer for an hour and a half and it seems like no time has passed at all. It's like you just started and bang, you know, that you look at your watch and it's, you know, an hour and a half later. So... When we worship him, we are to worship him in spirit and in truth, which means we step out of time. We step out of the continuum here and into him. He is a new continuum, one that is past our understanding according to the dictionary. Praise the Lord. Because there's depth in him that you don't have anywhere else, that you're not going to experience anyplace else. Amen. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. So let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So what you say matters. And in this time that we're living in, we're going to experience things that we've never experienced before. And what the Lord is telling me is that we need to be ready and we need to recognize Now we may be in time and space, but he isn't and he's with us. And if we can connect with him, we can, we can step out of it. We can not be confined to what time and space offers us or tries to force upon us. Amen? Am I making any sense yet? Hallelujah. So God is a continuum. And, and the continuum, a continuum by definition is... Uh, a whole quantity or series, a thing whose parts cannot be separated or separately discerned, like space and time. All right? That's God. When you add the depth, when you add the beyond what we can function in. Amen? So look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37. And I, what I'm saying is God's trying to take us out of the, you know, we say, well, we're not religious. And we're not. We're probably a, uh, about as unreligious as, a, as you can be and still call it church. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And I'm not talking about being sinful and hateful and all. I'm just saying not religious. We're trying not to be. We're, we're working at not being religious. Amen. So everything that, that we're doing, we're trying to do it in a way that just is being led by the Spirit. Now, we'll make mistakes, and there'll be, you know, that's why we have the Holy Spirit, to bump us back in just where we need to be if we get out of it. Amen? And, you know, you see the kids running all over and, and doing what they do. They're kids. That's what kids do. And, and so it, is that going to quench the Holy Ghost? Not mine. Amen? I mean, he's, he's a little bigger than that. In fact, so much so that the disciples had a feeling that a lot of 
religious people have, and that is keep them out of this thing because we're trying to do something for God here. And, and Jesus said, no, bring them over here. Even infants, it says in one translation, that he took and held in his lap, and the disciples are going, come on. Man, we, the last thing we need is a baby crapping in your lap and, and you know, throwing up on you and all this kind of stuff. How, what kind of, how are we going to have church like this? And Jesus said, suffer them. This is such is the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's not religious, folks. It just isn't. Praise the Lord. So he said, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So what comes out of your mouth is going to determine a lot of your life, a lot of what goes on around you and with you. Praise the Lord. Everything, and here's what he's saying, everything should be brought to the test of the word and the spirit. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Not only the word, right, but word and the spirit. Because you, we, you can go to any college, any university, and speak with... Uh, theology, professors of theology, and you can get all the word you can ever handle. Yeah. I mean, that's what happened in the, in the century uh, of the time that Jesus was living, right? He said, you know the word. You got the word. The problem is you don't know what you're do, supposed to do with it. You, the spirit is absent. So all you have is a lot of information. Amen? So not only the word, but the word and the spirit. We, information... Without the Spirit is just data. Yeah. It, it's just information. You need the Spirit in order for it to become revelation. Yes. And here's the deal. That's why you can be having, uh, you know, we can all be hearing the same thing in, in, an, in a corporate setting. And some people are getting revelation and other people are getting information. Yeah. And then days later, uh, one of those people who maybe didn't get the revelation at that particular time, for, for whatever reason, will all of a sudden see it, and they'll go, whoa, let me show you this, and you're going, yeah? <laughs> well, it's not to put that person down, but see, it just became revelation to them, something that you had already understood to be revelation, right? It doesn't diminish the revelation, but sometimes it, it hurts the person who just got it because we don't rejoice with them. We're not as excited as we were when we first saw it. Yeah. And it happens to us. We all read the Bible and, and have read certain scriptures over and over and over, and then all of a sudden one day we yep. read it and go, oh, my God, yep. never saw that. Yep. And, and that's, so that's, but that's the difference between just having information or data and actually having revelation. Yep. So it's never possible to have the Spirit without at least, at least some measure of faith, without some measure of truth. Okay? Right. In other words, if the Spirit's moving, you're going to get some measure right. of, of truth. Right. Amen? Amen? But it is possible to have a shell of the truth without any spirit whatsoever. Yes. You can go places and they'll preach the Bible. They'll be reading the scripture. That's, that's the truth. But absolutely no spirit whatsoever. It just sounds like you're sitting in a math class. Right? right? right. So Joshua, look at, look at this in Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. So Joshua was a guy who put, he had been following uh, Moses. I mean, he was kind of his right-hand man. He was his aide de camp or whatever you want to call him. And Moses dies. Now, he's freaked out because he's left in charge, and he doesn't know if I can do this stuff. Because God, his God actually was as much Moses as it was the God. He depended on Moses yeah. to tell him what God was doing and saying and, and what should we do next. And so he had put all of his confidence, really, in this person, which wasn't a bad thing because Moses was, did have the voice of God coming to him on a regular basis. But, J, but, but uh, Joshua really didn't. He was just depending on Moses. Well, we're in a time, and that's why you're seeing yes. you know, people operating here. I mean, it may kind of throw you off a little bit because it's not what you're used to. And I've got to tell you, sometimes it's, it's a little uncomfortable for me. I'm not you know, totally understanding of all of it either, but I told the Lord... A long time ago, I'm, I want you to have your way, even if it makes me a little uncomfortable at times. So I need to, I need to get God's voice from every direction I can get it. I, I can't be so uh, arrogant or so uh, stupid as to think that I'm the only one hearing from God because I'm getting a very limited word that way. I'm getting very limited information in that way. Amen. 
And I don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not judging anybody, that's not what I'm saying, I'm just saying as a human being and as a pastor, you know, it's, it's, it's just not always, you, you know, I've got to get in the flow like everybody else, in other words. I've got to be able to release my Nathan so that the Jesus in me can get on board with what's going on. And I want to do that, and I'm going to do that, right? And we all need to do the same thing. So I'm just saying the reason we're, we're doing what we're doing is because we need all of God that there is. We need every opportunity for God to speak to us and minister to us however he wants to do that. That's, that's real church, folks. That's not, it ain't going to be religious, it's, and it's going to be awkward and a little uncomfortable at times simply because you, gotta, you have to determine to be a part of it. You, see, I mean, it's not like religion. You can just go and sit there and be either accepted or rejected or just be blank and, and just be there. It ain't, that's not what God's wanting. He's wanting every part of his body to be involved in what he's doing. Right? That means everybody. So when God gives you a word, you need to share it. I mean, he, he, just like what Jane did, just like what Jody, Tammy, Suzanne Anybody who spoke today, for whatever reason, even if it's about healing for somebody else, that's participation. That's being part of the body. That's functioning so that we're all working together. That's what God honors. That's what he's looking for. Amen? So Joshua says, there shall not, uh, or God, I should say, is speaking to Joshua. Why? Because Joshua's got the same issues we got. He's wondering, can I hear from God? Or is it just these other people. No, these other people are doing it to encourage you and to, uh, you know, arm you with the same weapons to recognize, hey, that's Suzanne. I know Suzanne. I can do this. I just have to be willing. I, I just have to give myself to it, right? So that's what's happening here with Joshua. There shall not any man, Jesus, the Lord is talking to him and he says, there shall not any man be able to stand before you thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses so I will be with you. I will not fail you, nor forsake you. Praise the Lord. So that's God is saying that to all of us. Whatever you see me do with anybody, I'll do it with you. I'll, I'll do the same thing for you and with you if you'll make yourself available to me, if you'll believe it. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the priority of God is truth. Amen. The Word of God. That's the truth. His covenant, in other words, the Word of God is His covenant in words. Amen? But not just in words, in the words and spirit. Amen? Spirit truth. The Word, Jesus said, my Word is spirit and life. It's truth. Praise the Lord. So our calling for all of us, a lot like Joshua, is to work the work of God. God had a purpose in what he was doing with Israel and what he was doing with Joshua and Moses. It was God's plan. It was what God wanted. But he needed people to do it. So our calling is no different. God is wanting us to work the works of God. And that can't be done in the flesh. It just will not be done that way. God won't allow it to be done that way. No matter how gifted we are, no matter how strong we are, no matter how brilliant we are, no matter how whatever, dedicated and determined we are, it won't happen but by the Spirit. God has to do this through us. He has to have willing vessels, and then He can flow. Then He can work and do what He wants to do. Amen? Praise the Lord. And so, uh, no matter what, look at uh, Genesis 1. Uh, verse 1 through 3. Genesis 1, verses 1 through 3. For in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Verse 28. 
And God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Praise the Lord. All right. So Genesis 1 is the word. It's revelation. It's releasing revelation, right? All right. Look at John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. And remember this, now when we move on. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Again, we've got Word, and we've got revelation. We've got Word and actually manifestation. Right? So, no matter what, God is the antecedent. He's always the first. He's always the first one there. Amen? God, why? Because He's everywhere. Again, the continuum, right? Before everything, the continuum. Amen? Because he is, we are. And everything else is. So he's the beginning one. Self-caused. Self-contained. Self-sufficient. So we can't think of God correctly unless we think of him as always being there and being there first. And Joshua had to learn that. So Joshua chapter 1, verse 5 again. And again, let's take this personal, right? It's not just a story about Joshua. Like someone said already today, God is talking to you. It's personal. So there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Chapter 3, verse 7. This is your story. Yes. I mean, this is about you. Yes. And the Lord said unto Joshua, the Lord said unto Jody, the Lord said unto Sally, the Lord said to Dan, the Lord said to Eric, the Lord said to each one of you, add your name there, this day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of Israel, and that they might know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so nothing had changed. Right? As far as God was concerned, nothing had changed at all. Noah died, or excuse me, Moses had died, but as far as God was concerned, everything was just the same as it was before he died. I'm not saying God isn't compassionate or doesn't care. I'm just saying nothing had changed, amen, because nothing had been lost. As I was, so I will be. Because it isn't about Moses. It was about me and Moses. It isn't about Joshua. It was about me and Joshua. So it isn't about you. It's about God and you. As he was, so he will be. Praise the Lord. Now, I told Sally this story, and I I just said it in a random kind of way Wednesday night. But there was this group of rabbis, and this is back in the time after the destruction of the temple. And the temple is in ruins. And this half a dozen rabbis are coming up. They're standing there by the ruins of the temple and a bunch of them they just start weeping and they see a fox runs out of the debris and the other rabbi starts laughing the one by himself he's laughing the other the rest of them are all crying and he says what are you crying for and they said why are you laughing and he said well you tell me and I'll tell you and they said well we're weeping because look at our temple look at Look at God's dwelling place on earth. Look at, the, look at this place. Now, why are you laughing? And he said, because God prophesied the destruction of the temple. And he also just prophesied the rebuilding of the temple. Yeah. And vi- that Israel would be ultimately victorious. Yeah. That's why I'm laughing. Because that destruction is proof to me of what God what God has done is proof to me about what God is going to do and that's the way we need to look at things God has given us promises just because we're looking at a mess doesn't and what it tells us is yes there's going to be crap he told us in this world we'll have tribulation but be of good cheer you will overcome because I'm an I have overcome so we ought to be laughing 
Amen. Instead of freaking out. I see very few smiles out there. Praise the Lord. I'm just saying. Let, we need to look at things differently through our relationship with God, through his perspective. Yes. Ah, but you don't know the problem. I, I know you got problems because you're a human being. Right. We all got them. Right. You ought to be laughing because you got God on your side. Yes. You are going to yes. overcome, praise the Lord. Yes. You are going to be victorious. Yes. I mean, he's eternal. Yes. He's timeless. Yes. I am. Yes. I was. And I'm going to be. Praise the Lord. Timeless, changeless throughout eternity, throughout all of time. The eter eternal continuum. And you can begin wherever you want to. God's there first. He is. Alpha and Omega. Beginning and end. Which was, which is, which is to come. Look at Luke uh, 7, verse 31 and 32. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? Well, they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another saying, We've piped unto you and you haven't danced. We've mourned to you and you haven't wept. You see the little kids up here? And they're, they don't know what they're doing. They have no concept of this being a spiritual, you know, funk. they're just up here. They're just playing. Right? They could still get some stuff from the Lord by being involved, but they don't really have any consciousness of it. And that's what he's saying. That's what Jesus is saying here. He said he, they're talking about everything, but they're not stopping long enough to learn the truth of any of it. They, they're not valuing it. Right? And God, through his word, gives us insight to truth by his spirit. That's why you could have this same kind of thing going on in some churches and you'd have ushers dragging those kids out screaming, clawing at the carpet and ticking off the parents and grandparents and everybody else would be all freaked out and we'd have a, a melee and a, and a yeah. well, I just wanted to say something, show. A mess. You understand what I'm saying? Right? Why? Because it's all about decorum. It's all about doing things but not understanding why we're doing any of it. It's the unity of his uncreated being throughout all his works, all of his years. And it's saying to us, not only I did and I will do, but I am doing. Man, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost now. Praise the Lord. See, real productive faith demands that we grasp this truth, that we get a hold of this truth and hang on to it. Hallelujah. What I'm saying is we stand in our now. And we look back and we see God, what He's done in our past. And, and, and we're excited about that. That makes us feel great. Amen. We, we're praising God for what you did. You, the, the, the free ride I got. Amen. The, the trip I took. And that pickup that, you know, Traveled faster than the, sound, the, the speed of light. Yeah. Amen? So uh, what, I, what I'm saying is we stand in our now and we look back and we see God moving and, and then we look forward based on that and we think of what his potential is. God, any, you can do anything, God. You can stop this pandemic. You can, you can change the whole government. You can fix everything. You can make it all right. So I see his potential in the future. But now is uninhabited. Except for me. Except for ourselves. It's actually temporary atheism. And that's why I'm praying, God, I want to be conscious of you all the time. Everywhere I'm at, not to be a freak show, not to be weirdo and, and you know, talking in tongues everywhere I go, but to be aware so that when I'm at the grocery store, or I'm at Walmart, or I'm wherever I am, I know you're there. You're there. And I, I can be ready for whatever comes, for whatever you want to do, to be part of what it is. We talk about him, but we think of him as being absent. Look at John 21 and verse 25. 
John 21, 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. All the stuff he did. Now, I want you to think back to Genesis 1. All right, now let's go to Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now think, Genesis, think what we already read. God comes and he does a bunch of stuff. Supernatural, miraculous with his words. He creates. Miraculous. And then what's the next thing he does? He says to the man now, I want you to take dominion. Now, if you think of this in the same way, Jesus is doing all these things, all these miracles, all the miraculous, all that he's doing, words that he's declaring. And then he says what? I want you to take dominion now. I want you to learn from what I've done so that you can do. Now, John is the end of the Gospels. And those are the accounts of the miraculous things that Jesus did, right? All the works, all the words, everything that Jesus did. In fact, so much that, so that they said if we were to write all the, everything he said and did, there wouldn't be enough books to, to contain it. The miracles. And what is Acts is the Acts of the Apostles by the Holy Spirit. Miracle working ability. That's revelation. You say, what? Well, what's revelation? Genesis 1, what God said, and Genesis 2, man's dominion. The revelation is the end of the Gospels and the beginning of Acts. It's the placement of the two. That's the revelation. It's how they come together. The gospel could have been the end, as it was in Genesis. But it's not. It's the beginning. It's what God said, in the beginning. But Adam made it the end. Jesus said, this is the beginning. Well, this is the end of me and the beginning of you. The end of my work and the beginning of yours. Yes. Praise God. Yes. That's the revelation. The gospel, the word, it leads to acts. And the gospel, the word, always has to lead to acts. It's not enough to hear the gospel. It's not enough to have the message. It has to produce action. Yes. It wasn't enough for God to create everything and give man dominion and have man say, well, I'm not interested here. You can have it. When he gives us words, when he gives us revelation, we have one responsibility. Act. Yes, yes, yes. You have to act on it. Yes. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. We read this last week, but I think it's worth looking at again. Acts 4, 29 through 31. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, mm -hmm. and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak your word yes. by stretching forth your hand to heal. Yes and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. Yes. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, yes. where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. 
The, ga- the gospel, the word of God always has to produce acts. Yes. Yes. Every time you hear the good news, every time you hear the word of God, it enters your heart. You have to let it turn into an act. You have to let it turn into acts. Otherwise, it's not complete. It's not revelation. It's just words. It's just information. The gospel, the word of God, leads to acts. And that's one side of the revelation. The other side is the book of Acts begins with the gospel or the truth of God. So you can never produce the acts of God on your own. But as he was with them, he will be with us. As I was, so I will be. There was nothing special about those apostles except that they believed what God said and acted on it. The same thing Joshua did based on what he saw Moses. As I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. And God's saying the same thing to us. As I was with those apostles, I am with you. As I was, I will be. Joshua had to learn that. I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. Look at John chapter 20, verse 1 through 10. Hallelujah. I don't know anybody else. I'm excited because God's answering prayer for me. He's talking to me. And I know that he's talking to you. He's not a respecter of persons. If he's saying this to me, he's saying it to everybody. Praise the Lord. So the first day of the week came, cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runs and comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they've laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they, they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. He, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then come a sign with Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. Verse 19 through 21. It's odd. I mean, we, we th- assume that why wouldn't they know that? We've been reading this forever. They didn't know. They hadn't, it hadn't dawned on them that he's going to rise again, that there will be a resurrection. That's one of the reasons they were all freaked out. They thought everything they'd been putting their confidence in is gone. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me. Get this now. Even so send I you. As he was with me, he will be with you. Praise the Lord. Verse 27 through 29. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, for believe, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Amen. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are they that have not seen, but will believe. Amen. Continuum is what he's talking about. For all of our fears, we are never alone. Our trouble, our problem, is that we think of ourselves as being alone. Isaiah 43, verses 2 through 5. You say, but we're Christians. How how can we think of ourselves as being alone? I don't know, maybe I'm just different. But that's why I've been praying what I'm praying, because I don't want to be alone. I, I don't, I, I'm not talking about being, uh, you know, afraid of being alone. I'm, I'm 
a loner in a lot of ways. But I don't want to be alone without God. Praise the Lord. I want to be conscious of his presence at all times. And when thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east, and gather thee from the west. Praise the Lord. So just think of this. This river he's taught, he says, think of yourself standing by a river bank. And then think of the river as God himself. Remember, he says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in us. So the river is this living water. It's the Spirit of God. And so you look, you're standing there by the river bank, and you look to the left. I know a little bit about rivers. We live by rivers. Hallelujah. We've got a river just down the road from our place, the Skunk River. Isn't that, doesn't that conjure up beautiful images in your mind? Okay, let me get back to my thing. So you look to the left, and you see the river, and it's, and it's coming right out of your past. Right? You see it. It's just right there. And then you look to the right, and you see it flowing out into the future. But notice, it's also flowing right where you're standing. Right in your present. Not less than, not different from, but the very same river, unbroken, continuum, undiminished, constant in your past, in your present, and in your future. The same river. Joshua 1, verse 9 through 11. Praise God. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Remember this again, this is personal. Yes. He's talking to you. And then what did you do? Commanded. You commanded some stuff. Yeah. Amen. Saying, saying, pass through the host. Command the people, saying, prepare you victuals, for within three days you will pass over this Jordan and go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Pass through the host. Whatever it is, whatever the hindrance is, go get your promise. Go get what God has promised for you. You say what God said, and you go take it. You, you possess it. Yes. Because he's with you, the same as he was with Joshua, the same as he was with Moses, the same as he was with anybody, the apostles. Yes. As I was, I am. Yes. So go and possess your promise. Go get what I've given you. Go do what I've equipped you to do. Quit making excuses. Quit looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, but I tried and I can't. It's not about you. No. It's about the one that's with you. Yes. Wherever faith has been original, you could go through the scriptures and you'll see it. Wherever it's original, wherever it has proved itself to be real, it always has a sense of the presence of God in the middle of it. Yep. Praise God. The sense of someone there with us. A sense of the Word and the Spirit. The truth coming together. And what the disciples knew and did came from the conviction that there was one in the midst of them. Yes. Look, God, look at their threatenings. Right? Right? 
They knew the God of heaven was confronting them on earth. They were in the very presence of God. And that conviction kept their attention and it elevated them and it transformed them from being failures, from being fearful, from running from God to running to God, to believing whatever God said was possible. Mark 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It cost him everything. The ultimate sacrifice, even for God. And this is the love of God. This is what he's trying to get us to understand. Remember, he was dying in our place. So try to get that in the context or I may, I may lose you, praise the Lord. But he was dying in our place. We were crucified with him. Yes. Right? Yes. He became sin. Yes. He made himself the point of all judgment, the focus of all the judgment. Yes. So he had to be separated. We were with him. We were crucified with him. Yes. That's part of the judgment is separation from God. So who's the one saying this? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is interpreted, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken? Who's saying that? God. This is how real it is to God. This is that continuum. This is how real it is for God that it was us. I'm not taking away anything from what Jesus did, but I'm saying that's how God has identified as though we were actually there. And that's why sin is not accounted to us. That's why we are the righteousness of God. It's as real as if it was us. God is the one asking God why God has forsaken him. If you're not getting the continuum here, I just lost you. Praise the Lord. But God has forsaken by God. And he's speaking those words in our place. Yes. Yes. Romans 8, 35 through 39. And we say, God, where are you in this mess? And he's saying, duh. Please. And I'm praying, God, I want to I want to be conscious of you all. And he's thinking, what do I got to do? What must I do to get you to understand? I will never leave you or forsake you. How about believe the fundamental here, Nathan, before you try to cast out demons? I can do anything. I took you from point A to point B and you don't even know. You didn't even know what happened. All you know is you were here and now you're there. And you're wanting to know, can I know that you're with me? <laughs> Try that on your own. Because yeah. I don't care how fast a car you got. You'll either blow it up, kill somebody or yourself, or end up in jail. Just trying to do what you cannot do. There isn't a vehicle made that can go faster than light. That's resurrection power, and it comes from one place and one place only. Hallelujah. I was praying, Suzanne, that's so cool, because I was praying the other morning, and that's what I was praying. And you know what he said to me? I am the light. And I'm thinking, I, I, I argued with myself for 20 minutes. <laughs> Honest to God, praying. Now, I didn't have any paper or pen with me. And, I, and the thought came to me, go get a pencil and a paper and write this down. And I thought, no, that's you. That's you, Nathan. Not a light? Come on, it's got nothing to do with what you're talking about here. Because our minds are so limited, unless we're willing to think outside of what we normally think, we're going to miss a whole bunch of crap because that's what he was telling me. And I didn't know it until two days later. And now I'm trying to reconstruct 
the conversation and I can't do it. All I can remember is the one thing, the life. But he's gracious, gracious enough to give me something to confuse you with, praise the Lord. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, past understanding, nor any other creature. He's talking about the continuum, amen, shall ever be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. The one saying those words, who is it? Im Anu El. Emmanuel. God with us. And why is that awesome? Because it means when we're going through the darkest moments in our life, when we feel the most helpless, when we feel the most fear, the anxiety, Things aren't happening the way I thought they were supposed to happen. It isn't, this hasn't happened. That hasn't happened. There's confusion. You feel forsaken. You feel like God's just saying, I'm sorry, you're going to have to work this one out on your own. Even then, He's going to be with us. And you can laugh. Because as He was, He will be. What He has said, He will do. Not He was with us. Not one of these days he'll be with us. He is yes. with us. Yes. Think of it. Yes. Now, I'm still talking continuum. If God was with us, even when he was separated from God, and he's God. I mean, this... I, I love thinking it, but it's just... It's like when I was a little kid trying to think of eternity. I remember laying in bed thinking, where is... Surely there's an end to that someplace. You know, it, it must, there has to be a boundary. There has to be some, I can remember just being a little kid thinking that. There's nothing in this world that can separate us. If God separated himself from himself for me, there's nothing that can separate him from me. Nothing beyond this world, nothing in this age, nothing in the ages to come that will ever separate us from the love of God in him who is the love of God and who will be with us always and forever. Now I'm going to close with this. All of us go through times when we feel like, where's God? The check didn't come, Right? The baby's sick. The doctor doesn't have an answer. Everything's going to hell in a hand, hand cart. Go to the book of Esther sometime because it's different from every other book in the Bible. What makes it different? The name of God makes it different. The name of God? The absence of the name of God makes it different. It's the only book in the Bible without one mention of God in it. Sounds like a godless book. And the truth is it was filled with godlessness. Evil people, evil plans trying to annihilate God's people. And it's not just the name of God that's missing, but the signs of his presence. Darkness reigns and God is nowhere to be found. So does that make the book of Esther less holy than the other books of the Bible? Not at all. We know. Ask the ladies here. They did entire Bible classes and studies and, and, and rightfully so. 
even though the name of God isn't mentioned, the hand of God, the presence of God lies behind every event that takes place in that book. He's there. He's unseen. He's unmentioned. And yet he's working all things together and turning every event around in order to fulfill his purpose. To take care of his people. Esther is the book of the unmentioned God. And that book is a most holy book. A book that speaks to all the times in our lives when we don't feel the presence of God. When we don't hear his voice. When we don't see his hand. When there's no sign of his love. No sign of his purpose. When he seems far away. Or not there at all. So when all these signs, without any signs, and when all we're seeing is darkness, that's the time of the unmentioned God. Just laugh. It's telling you this. Even though you don't feel his presence, it's still there. It reminds me of the psalm that we sing a lot of times. Even when you don't see him, he's working. Even when you don't feel him, he's working. Even though you don't feel his presence, he's still there. Even though you don't see his hand, it's still moving. And when you don't hear his voice, he's still speaking in the silence. Even when you feel abandoned and alone, his love is still there. And even when he feels hopelessly far away from you, he's still there right beside you. He's there working every detail in your life for his purposes. For your redemption. For your victory. I know my thoughts towards you. For good and not evil. Hmm? For an end that I have planned. For a destiny. A purpose. And in the end, the light breaks through the darkness. God's word and spirit prevails. And you'll know that you were never alone. He was with you all along. And it was holy. It was the time of your life and the unmentioned God. A couple more scriptures and I will close. Psalms 139, verse 7 through 12. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it, raise it even to the foundation thereof. Talking about the destruction. Yes, please. Pardon? 139, yeah. Whether shall I go from the Spirit Whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, But the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light, they're both alike to thee. And Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and we'll close with it. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Praise God. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Praise God. 
height, length, breadth. But he's the God of the continuum, the deep, the past understanding. Hallelujah. The God who is always victorious and makes us victorious in every situation and circumstance. He is with us. Even in the silence, he's speaking. Hallelujah. The unmentioned God is yelling, here I am. I'm right here. I'm with you. Praise God. He wants to tell us the things that we have trouble understanding. He wants to be everything to us. And he wants us to be everything to one another. Here's my commandment, he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. We've talked about covenants, and I really believe we are one body, so we have a blood covenant with the Lord, but we also have that covenant with one another. The body can't be separated. We have to be in covenant with each other. We need to see our own reflection in each person that we're looking at here, and that reflection is Jesus the presence of the Lord. Amen. If anybody wants prayer, if you have any needs, if you just want to talk to the Lord for a minute, if you want to have prayer, if you want to pray for somebody, now's the time to do it. The area is open. Suzanne is available. Uh, Jody, uh, anybody else uh, is welcome to step up. And, and if you feel a, a burden or you feel a conviction to pray for somebody, uh, please do it. Now's the time. Don't put it off. Don't think, ah, oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Jesus is with you. God is with you right now. Praise the Lord. No obligation, but if God's speaking to you about anything, come and let God bless you even more. Receive everything that he has for you. Otherwise, you're dismissed. In the name of Jesus.